The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders. On the surface, wealthy plastic surgeon James and his homemaker wife, Julia, are the picture-perfect power couple. But behind closed doors, they both wrestle with personal demons. Who's Miss Triple X? When their marriage hits the rocks, Detectives must look for a mysterious plus-size lady All right. who's dressed to kill. City blessed with natural beauty. We'll lift a little here. But for some citizens, natural is a relative term. While we're at it, take care of that neck. It's quite a waddle you have. James is a respected plastic surgeon with a very successful practice. Can you please come in here for a moment? His wife, Julia, is a happy homemaker and devoted mother to their only child, Isabel. Isabel has her riding lesson at 4 o'clock. Can you please make sure she's properly attired? James earns the big bucks, and Julia runs the household. It's 1984, so it's not that unusual a setup. On the surface, they appear to be playing their roles perfectly. But looks can be deceiving. I don't like to be kept waiting. James has a reputation for being a strict taskmaster. Oh, sorry. I was in the bathroom. I bet you were taking a bubble bath, getting ready to see your secret lover later. <sighs> James, please. I've got errands to run. Hmm. You know, it seems like Dr. James is not just a taskmaster, but controlling and a little bit paranoid. But I guess it comes with the territory. I mean. I might be paranoid if I had to please wealthy and potentially litigious clients. Or could it be he's not paranoid and Julia is actually having an affair? Can you blame her? But there was a time when James wasn't always so in control. As for Julia, she was a free spirit who dreamed of becoming a painter. She suffered from dramatic mood swings, which she managed by self-medicating with coilers and Benzedrine. You gotta be careful with uppers like Benny's and downers like Lou's because you don't want to go up when you need to go down and down when you need to go up. Not that I would know. I mean, back in 77, I'd just bought my first Farrah Fawcett poster. But back to Julie and James. The thing with addicts, even the so-called high-functioning types, is they rely on their fix to get them through the day. The balancing act lasts only so long. Hi, uh, my name is Gail, and I'm an addict. Hi, Gail. Hi, Gail. Julia and James meet at a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. Even though it's against the rules to date while in Narcotics Anonymous, James and Julia can't resist one another. In the midst of kicking their habits, their relationship yes. takes an unexpected I'm turn. A baby? <laughs> After a shotgun wedding, James opens his own plastic surgery clinic and expects right. Julia to quit her job and raise their child. But a few years into their picture-perfect marriage, cracks start to appear. You're wearing that. Where's the Halston? I thought this would be more appropriate for tonight. Appropriate for what? A hoedown? If I ever talk to my wife like that, well, I don't, because waiting for the other shoe to drop makes me nervous. Anyway, Dr. James is what we call a dry drunk. His fix is controlling every aspect of his life, especially his wife. 
And as for Julia, well, she became a homemaker for this guy. She may love the money, but I can bet she's not loving the price she's having to pay. Go change, we're going to be late. No, I like this dress. Then you can stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Get ready, ladies. Here we go. One, a two, a one, two, step together. Yes. Julia, and no longer together. content to play the role of happy yes. homemaker and that James together. expects, starts asserting her independence. Now watch me for the pony. Pony? I'm a Rubik star, Penis V King. How can I help you become your most fabulous self? Put my wife on the phone now. Julia's getting her groove back, and for a guy with James' ego and weaknesses, if he's losing control over his wife, then that makes him terrified he's losing control of his life. She's teaching a class right now. Call back. When someone with James' coping mechanisms, or lack of them, is scared, they don't just run and hide. No, they come out swinging. Well, if it isn't my little Jane Fonda home from another long day of leg lifts. James, your material's getting old. Why don't you do your act for somebody that cares? Are you forgetting who pays your way? James, stop. Or what, you'll leave? I've heard that before, honey. You wouldn't last a minute out there without my money. And you won't get Izzy. She can do better than a mother who neglects her. You want to play dirty? Careful, because I'm ready to roll around in the mud. I don't know where my wife is. Leave me alone, for Christ's sakes. A successful surgeon and his beautiful wife make a pretty picture. But from the looks of the bedroom and the aftermath of their fight, it's a whole other story. It's possible Julia has taken off to cool down, or she's making plans to leave for good. When Julia misses her aerobics classes that afternoon, her boss, Serafina, is concerned and goes to the police. This is not like Julia. Her husband hated her working, like hated. You should hear the way he speaks to her. All right, what is it you want me to do? Find Julia! <laughs> what if I could? I'm just telling you there are procedures. James might be controlling and verbally abusive, but while that's repulsive, it's not enough to open an investigation, yet. A person can't be declared officially missing until they've been gone at least 48 hours, and police will only conduct a search if they believe the disappearance is suspicious. A few days later, detectives get a call from a gas station attendant. I was just taking out the trash, man. Honest. Uh-huh. Julia, huh? With 48 hours passed and the discovery of her ID, Julia is now officially considered a missing person. In the same bag as the ID, detectives find rope and nail clippers with what looks like dried blood on them, and an assortment of women's garments, all sized extra, extra large. I know, right? That's a whole lot of woman. Julia is petite, so I'd rule out the wardrobe as being hers, but whoever it does belong to, could be involved with her disappearance or has knowledge of her whereabouts. The nail clippers are gonna need to be tested because if the blood on them is a match to Julia, well, that might be evidence she was taken against her will. But before police go hunting for a Rubenesque mystery woman with colorful taste, they need to start closer to home. The first person they're gonna wanna talk to is the husband. Detectives want to know why James didn't report Julia as missing. It's not the first time she's done this. The last time she abandoned her car behind a video rental store. Well, how do you explain her ID found with a pile of garments that 
shall we say, should have belonged to someone with more generous proportions? Absolutely no idea. All right. We had a fight. I found some used condoms behind the bed, so I confronted her. My guess is she ran away with her new lover. It's Julia's, in case you need a scent for the sniffer dogs. This guy is so caring, it kind of, it gets me right there. But giving cops your wife's blouse to get a scent for search dogs isn't the weirdest thing I've ever run across during any kind of investigation. In fact, I had this one guy who claimed to have a split personality, only the other personality was a dog. And I don't speak Rottweiler. Well, bits and pieces, but not fluent. So James has answers for all the police's questions, but as a cop, when you've got the scent of something that doesn't feel quite right, you gotta follow your nose and see where it takes you. Detective Falco talks with Serafina, hoping she can shed some more light on Julia's whereabouts. I told you something was up, but you didn't listen. All right, you know what? I'm listening now. I'm all ears. Did she have any secrets? Okay, look, her husband came to me. He indicated that she might be having something on the side. What? Jimmy Boy's the one with the secrets. Julia told me everything. Serafina tells detectives that Julia got suspicious that her husband was having an affair. She broke into a chest that James forbade her to touch, looking for evidence. Don't touch those. Who's Miss Triple X, huh? They are not triple X. <sighs> Whatever. But they are cheap. Okay then, big ladies' underwear. It's becoming a theme. But what exactly James is doing with a bunch of women's clothes in a locked chest in his bedroom is a mystery. Or is it? Could it be just a little kinky? Fool denied that he was cheating on her, and he even commanded her to stop breaking into his guilty treasures box. Oh, sorry. Want one? I don't do candy. Suit yourself. Oh my God. All right, so you have any other information about Julia leaving her husband? Yeah. Serafina reveals that Julia had been planning her exit for some time, stashing away money and looking for an apartment for her and Isabel. She was really gonna do it this time even though she was petrified. Because if James found out, oh Lord. You have to tell me where you're disappearing all night. Me? Yes. Where were Julia you last confessed night, huh? to Serafina that she and James argued. Leave and me alone. was becoming more and more what violent and lover? paranoid. Can your lover buy you all new clothes? No. Serafina tells police that Julia couldn't bear the constant threat of abuse and violence. I swear to you, there's no lover. <sighs> That's got a smart, and it looked like real silk, too. Julia's adamant she's not cheating, but James is not buying it. But that could be a classic misdirect. If you're the one having the affair, then you go on the offensive to shake any suspicion. All those big lady clothes, they make you wonder, could James have a mistress and they did something to take Julia out of the picture? But until police find Julia, it's only a theory. But then, detectives catch a break. They get a call that a body has been found behind a video arcade that matches Julia's description. The body is officially ID'd as Julia. From the state of decomposition, I'd say Julia has been dead more than a few days. So that puts it right around the time her husband claims she ran off with another guy. Now that they have Julia's body, they need to trace how it got there. And back in 84, when I started in the Bureau, forensics was a lot less high tech, but the same rules applied. You wanna solve a murder, you start with what the body tells you. The autopsy concludes that Julia's cause of death was suffocation. 
The red fibers on her body turn out to be satin. And the towel Julia was wrapped in is determined to be a rare and expensive I'm brand sorry. from Turkey. When police search the house, they discover a pillow with a trace of blood on it. Under the bed, they find a towel that is an exact replica of the one Julia's body was wrapped in. You say, Steve, why not check the DNA? Well, back in 84, DNA profiling was just being developed. Nobody had ever even used it in a case. So to make a case in the 80s, it took more legwork. Every single piece of evidence has to conclusively connect to the crime. Back then, we just couldn't wave the DNA wand. Thank you. When the fibers on the pillow were tested, they're found to be a match for those found on Julia's body. And the blood on the pillow is Julia's blood type. That's enough for police to bring James in for questioning. But they can't find him anywhere. They search his bank records and discover that James has been withdrawing huge amounts of cash. They're worried he's planning on fleeing the country. Police managed to track James down at his travel agents. What do you say we make like a stripper? Absolutely not. I know my rights. Actually, James, you don't. It's not uncommon for the police to ask people taken into custody to strip down. In this case, it's a chance to photograph any injuries, tattoos, or scars that can be key in their investigation. If James is hiding any cuts, bruises, or markings, the hope is they can be linked to Julia's murder. The police identify recent scarring on James's torso and a little something else. I am the big lady. Oh, you're a big something, James. I gotta admit, I didn't see that coming. So the lingerie at the gas station and the secret trunk all belong to James. My question is, where did he get that little lacy number? It's cute. Not on him. There is no mystery lady. James, the dominant controlling plastic surgeon, is a cross-dresser. Talk about a not-so-sweet transvestite. Cross-dressing comes from the man's desire to explore his feminine side, and for many guys, it's an outlet for stress. The more tension at work or home, the more they want to dress up. With his marriage on the rocks, his addiction, and the stress of keeping his cross-dressing a secret, well, James was probably one big hot mess. But big panties alone don't prove that he killed his wife. The police need more evidence to make a murder charge stick. So tell me, have you ever seen this guy before? Yeah, man. That dude was a real jerk. Turns out, on oh, the yeah. same day Julia's body was found, just being James so went to the gas station loud. to get his car detailed. He was uh, mucho particular with his trunk being spotless. Hmm. I'll bet he was. And I'll bet he didn't tip either, but Mick just nailed the last piece into place. The evidence against James is coming together. The fibers on Julia's body match the pillow at the house that's got her blood on it. She was wrapped in the exact same towel found in the house. Serafina's statement sets up James' threatening behavior, and Mick puts James at the gas station with his car the day of Julia's disappearance. And I'll bet, just a bet, when they examine the car trunk, they're gonna find more evidence. Now, if the police can get James to confess, they can tie this case up with a nice big bow. Hello, it's been an hour. What's going on? Finally. Thank you. Though I would have preferred a sparkling water. Oh, would you? <sighs> 
James, it's time for you to stop yammering and listen up for a change. Detective Falco lays out all the evidence they have tying James to Julia's death. We swept the trunk. There are traces of Julia's hair and blood all over it. We got you dead to rights, man. Anything to say? Fine. Yes. I did it. But it was in self-defense. Now, how did he come up with that one? Well, I'll bet James likes to watch cop dramas when he's not doing tummy tucks and facelifts. My money's on Cagney and Lacey. No, no, Miami Vice. That show was awesome. What about the lingerie? What about the wig? Leave this alone. Tell me, James. Tell me. Leave it alone. Leave James this admits alone. he and Julia were arguing like they always did. But then she got ugly. I know what you are. Don't deny it. How could you? What if people find out? We'll be laughing stocks. Julia, please. I beg you. Julia's reaction to James' big secret is not unusual. This was the early 80s, after all, and people were a little bit less accepting about men dressing like women. James' shame at being found out and being rejected by his wife must have been too much for this control freak to bear. I won't let you ruin my life! In fear of his life, James says he acted out of instinct. claimed that after he killed Julia, he put her in the car and tried to bury the body at a friend's country house. But that didn't work out. So he parked the car for the weekend before he finally found a dumpster. She just didn't understand. She was so small town. I had to destroy my best bra and panty set because of her. Can I please get that sparkling water? James has spilled his big lacy secret, but so far they've only got his side of the story. Unless Julia can speak up from the grave. Hi, detective. But Ooh, evidence from an unexpected source threatens to blow that claim out of the water. Where did you get this? It's from Julia. Julia sent a letter to her boss the day before her death. Turns out, Julia was planning to use the evidence of James cross-dressing to blackmail him. Apparently, she'd known about his fancy for woman's lingerie for a while. She was threatening to blow his cover if he didn't give her a divorce, alimony, and full custody of their child. Blackmail is a really strong motive for murder. His professional reputation was on the line. He was terrified of losing everything. His career, his money, the life he built. And given his control issues, violent behavior, and the deep shame he felt about his cross-dressing fetish, Julia was playing with fire. With the help of the letter, police pieced together what likely happened that night. No, don't go in there. Julia! Julia finally had enough of James's paranoia and abuse and decided to fight back. Blushing bride, French maid, oh, my favorite, the naughty nurse. Do not touch those. Be my guest. I've got copies. I want a divorce. And if you try to take Izzy away from me, I will not hesitate to use them in court. I don't think you can threaten me. Julia is counting on James giving into her threat, but instead, he snaps. Uh, I do not lose. Don't you forget it. Upon further analysis, the medical examiner rules that James's wounds were self-inflicted with nail clippers. James tried to make it look like Julia attacked him, but good old-fashioned detective work and science got the better of him. Even though DNA wasn't around as a technique in 84, forensics did the job of tying him to the crime, and James' self-defense claim 
is shut down. I wonder if he's got a special prison ensemble in his wardrobe. An orange, maybe? James is charged with second-degree murder. But on the way to his first court appearance, James collapses. He's rushed to hospital, where he dies. Turns out that James had terminal cancer, and he knew his days were numbered. He was so terrified of losing his status as the rich, successful surgeon that he was willing to do whatever it took to keep it, including murder. But in the end, he wasn't even around to care. He didn't go through a public trial that exposed his cross-dressing secret. So he got to keep his precious reputation and get out of serving hard time for killing Julia. It's kind of the ultimate get-out-of-jail-free card. Jeez, the length some people will go to.